Preface of The Riddle of the Sands This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Gesine. The Riddle of the Sands by Erskine Childers Preface A word about the origin and authorship of this book. In October last, 1902, my friend Carruthers visited me in my chambers, and, under a provisional pledge of secrecy, told me frankly the whole of the adventure described in these pages. Till then I had only known as much as the rest of his friends, namely, that he had recently undergone experiences during a yachting cruise with a certain Mr. Davies, which had left a deep mark on his character and habits. At the end of his narrative which, from his bearing on studies and speculations of my own, as well as from its intrinsic interest and racy delivery, made a very deep impression on me. He added that the important facts discovered in the course of the cruise had, without a moment's delay, been communicated to the proper authorities, who, after some dignified incredulity, due in part, perhaps, to the pitiful inadequacy of their own secret service, had, he believed, made use of them, to avert a great national danger. I say, he believed, for though it was beyond question that the danger was averted for the time, it was doubtful whether they had stirred a foot to combat it, the secret discovered being of such a nature that mere suspicion of it on this side was likely to destroy its efficacy. There, however that may be, the matter rested for a while, as for personal reasons which will be manifest to the reader he and Mr. Davies expressly wished it to rest. But events were driving them to reconsider their decision. These seemed to show that the information wrung with such peril and labour from the German government, and transmitted so promptly to our own, had had none but the most transitory influence on our policy. Forced to the conclusion that the national security was really being neglected, the two friends now had a mind to make their story public and it was about this that Carruthers wished for my advice. The great drawback was that an Englishman, bearing an honoured name, was disgracefully implicated, and that unless infinite delicacy were used, innocent persons, and especially a young lady, would suffer pain and indignity if his identity were known. Indeed, troublesome rumours containing a grain of truth and a mass of falsehood were already afloat, after weighing both sides of the question, I gave my vote emphatically for publication. The personal drawbacks could, I thought, with tact be neutralised, while from the public point of view nothing but good could come from submitting the case to the common sense of the country at large. Publication, therefore, was agreed upon, and the next point was the form it should take. Carruthers, with the concurrence of Mr. Davies, was for a bold exposition of the essential facts, stripped of their warm human envelope. I was strongly against this course, first, because it would aggravate instead of allaying the rumours that were current, secondly, because in such a form the narrative would not carry conviction, and would thus defeat its own end. The persons and the events were indissolubly connected. To evade, abridge, suppress would be to convey to the reader the idea of a concocted hoax. Indeed, I took bolder ground still, urging that the story should be made as explicit and circumstantial as possible, frankly and honestly for the purpose of entertaining, and so of attracting a wide circle of readers. Even anonymity was undesirable. Nevertheless, certain precautions were imperatively needed. To cut the matter short, they asked for my assistance and received it at once. It was arranged that I should edit the book, that Carruthers should give me his diary and recount to me in fuller detail and from his own point of view all the phases of the quest, as they used to call it, that Mr. Davies should meet me with his charts and maps and do the same, and that the whole story should be written as from the mouth of the former, with its humours and errors, its lights and its dark side, just as it happened, with the following few limitations. The year it belongs to is disguised, 
the names of persons are throughout fictitious, and, at my instance, certain slight liberties have been taken to conceal the identity of the English characters. Remember also that these persons are living now in the midst of us, and if you find one topic touched on with a light and hesitating pen, do not blame the editor, who, whether they are known or not, would rather say too little than say a word that might savour of impertinence. E. C. March 1903 Note The maps and charts are based on British and German Admiralty charts, with irrelevant details omitted. End of Preface Read by Gesine in April 2007of the riddle of the sands this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by gazina the riddle of the sands by erskine childers chapter 1 the letter i have read of men who when forced by their calling to live for long periods in utter solitude save for a few black faces, have made it a rule to dress regularly for dinner in order to maintain their self-respect and prevent a relapse into barbarism. It was in some such spirit, with an added touch of self-consciousness, that at seven o'clock in the evening of 23rd of September in a recent year, I was making my evening toilet in my chambers in Pall Mall. I thought the date and the place justified the parallel, to my advantage even, for the obscure Burmese administrator might well be a man of blunted sensibilities and coarse fibre, and at least he is alone with nature, while I, well, a young man of condition and fashion, who knows the right people, belongs to the right clubs, has a safe, possibly a brilliant future in the foreign office, may be excused for a sense of complacent martyrdom when, with his keen appreciation of the social calendar, he is doomed to the outer solitude of London in September. I say martyrdom, but in fact the case was infinitely worse. For to feel oneself a martyr, as everybody knows, is a pleasurable thing, and the true tragedy of my position was that I had passed that stage. I had enjoyed what sweets it had to offer in ever-dwindling degree since the middle of August, when ties were still fresh and sympathy abundant. I had been conscious that I was missed at Morven Lodge party. Lady Ashley herself had said so in the kindest possible manner when she wrote to acknowledge the letter in which I explained, with an effectively austere reserve of language, that circumstances compelled me to remain at my office. "'We know how busy you must be just now,' she wrote, and I do hope you won't overwork. We shall all miss you very much. Friend after friend got away to sport and fresh air, with promises to write and chaffing condolences, and as each deserted the sinking ship, I took a grim delight in my misery, positively almost enjoying the first week or two after my world had been finally dissipated to the four bracing winds of heaven. I began to take a spurious interest in the remaining five millions, and wrote several clever letters in a vein of cheap satire, indirectly suggesting the pathos of my position, but indicating that I was broad-minded enough to find intellectual entertainment in the scenes, persons, and habits of London in the dead season. I even did rational things at the instigation of others. For, though I should have liked total isolation best, I of course found that there was a sediment of unfortunates like myself, who, unlike me, viewed the situation in a most prosaic light. There were river excursions, and so on, after office hours, but I disliked the river at any time for its noisy vulgarity, and most of all at this season. So I dropped out of the fresh air brigade, and declined H's offer to share a riverside cottage and run up to town in the mornings. I did spend one or two weekends with the Catesbys in Kent, but I was not inconsolable when they let their house and went abroad, for I found that such partial compensations did not suit me. 
neither did the taste for satirical observation last. A passing thirst, which I dare say many have shared, for adventures of the fascinating kind described in the New Arabian Nights, led me on a few evenings into some shady haunts in Soho and farther eastward, but was finally quenched one sultry Saturday night after an hour's immersion in the reeking atmosphere of a low music hall in Ratcliffe Highway, where I sat next to a portly female who suffered from the heat, and at frequent intervals refreshed herself and an infant from a bottle of tepid stout. By the first week in September I had abandoned all palliatives, and had settled into the dismal but dignified routine of office, club and chambers. And now came the most cruel trial, for the hideous truth dawned on me that the world I found so indispensable could, after all, dispense with me. It was all very well for Lady Ashley to assure me that I was deeply missed, but a letter from F., who was one of the party, written, in haste, just starting to shoot, and coming as a tardy reply for one of my cleverest, made me aware that the house-party had suffered little from my absence, and that few sighs were wasted on me, even in the quarter which I had assumed to have been discreetly alluded to by the underlined all in Lady Ashley's We Shall All Miss You. A thrust which smarted more, if it bit less deeply, came from my cousin Nestor, who wrote, It's all horrid for you to have to be baking in London now, but after all, it must be a great pleasure to you, malicious little wretch, to have such interesting and important work to do. Here was a nemesis for an innocent illusion I had been accustomed to foster in the minds of my relations and acquaintances, especially in the breasts of the trustful and admiring maidens whom I had taken down to dinner in the last two seasons, a fiction which I had almost reached the point of believing in myself for the plain truth was that my work was neither interesting nor important, and consisted chiefly at present in smoking cigarettes, in saying that Mr. So-and-so was away and would be back about 1st of October, in being absent for lunch from 12 till 2, and in my spare moments making précis of, let us say, the less confidential consular reports, and squeezing the results into cast-iron schedules. The reason of my detention was not a cloud on the international horizon, though I may say in passing that there was such a cloud, but a caprice on the part of a remote and mighty personage, the effect of which, ramifying downwards, had dislocated the carefully laid holiday plans of the humble juniors, and in my own small case had upset the arrangement between myself and Kay, who positively liked the dog days in Whitehall. Only one thing was needed to fill my cup of bitterness, and this it was that specially occupied me as I dressed for dinner this evening. Two days more in this dead and fermenting city, and my slavery would be at an end. Yes, but, irony of ironies, I had nowhere to go to. The Morven Lodge party was breaking up. A dreadful rumour as to an engagement which had been one of its accursed fruits tormented me with a fresh certainty that I had not been missed, and bred in me that most desolating brand of cynicism which is produced by defeat through insignificance. Invitations for a later date, which I had declined in July with a gratifying sense of being much in request, now rose up spectrally to taunt me. There was at least one which I could easily have revived, but neither in this case nor in any other had there been any renewal of pressure, and there are moments when the difference between proposing oneself and surrendering as a prize to one of several eagerly competing hostesses seems too crushing to be contemplated. My own people were at Ez for my father's gout. To join them was a pis -aller, whose banality was repellent. Besides, they would be leaving soon for our home in Yorkshire, and I was not a prophet in my own country. In short, I was at the extremity of depression. The usual preliminary scuffle on the staircase prepared me for the knock and entry of Withers. 
one of the things which had for some time ceased to amuse me was the laxity of manners proper to the season among the servants of the big block of chambers where I lived. Withers demurely handed me a letter bearing a German postmark and marked urgent. I had just finished dressing and was collecting my money and gloves. A momentary thrill of curiosity broke in upon my depression as I sat down to open it. A corner on the reverse of the envelope bore the blotted legend, Very sorry, but there's one other thing. A pair of rigging screws from Carey and Nielsen's, size one and three-eighths, galvanized. Here it is. Yacht Dulcibella, Flensburg, Schleswig-Holstein, 21st of September. Dear Carruthers, I dare say you'll be surprised at hearing from me, as it's ages since we met. It is more than likely, too, that what I'm going to suggest won't suit you, for I know nothing of your plans, and if you're in town at all, you're probably just getting into harness again and can't get away. So I merely write on the off-chance to ask if you would care to come out here and join me in a little yachting, and I hope duck-shooting. I know you're keen on shooting, and I sort of remember that you have done some yachting, too, though I rather forget about that. This part of the Baltic, the Schleswig Fjords, is a splendid cruising ground, A1 scenery, and there ought to be plenty of duck about soon, if it gets cold enough. I came out here via Holland and the Frisian Islands, starting early in August. My pals have had to leave me, and I'm badly in want of another, as I don't want to lay up yet for a bit. I needn't say how glad I should be if you could come. If you can, send me a wire to the P.O. here. Flushing and on by Hamburg will be your best route, I think. I'm having a few repairs done here, and will have them ready sharp by the time your train arrives. Bring your gun and a good lot of number fours, and would you mind calling at Lancaster's and asking for mine, and bringing it too? Bring some oilskins. Better get the eleven-shilling sort, jacket and trousers, not the yachting brand. And if you paint, bring your gear. I know you speak German like a native, and that will be a great help. Forgive this hail of directions, but I've a sort of feeling that I'm in luck and that you'll come. Anyway, I hope you and the F.O. both flourish. Goodbye. Yours ever, Arthur H. Davis. Would you mind bringing me out a prismatic compass and a pound of raven mixture? This letter marked an epoch for me, but I little suspected the fact as I crumpled it into my pocket and started languidly at the Voix Douloureuse, which I nightly followed to the club. In Pall Mall there was no dignified greetings to be exchanged now with well-groomed acquaintances. The only people to be seen were some late stragglers from the park, with a perambulator and some hot and dusty children lagging fretfully behind, some rustic sightseers draining the last dregs of daylight in an effort to make out from their guide-books which of these reverend piles was which, a policeman and a builder's cart. Of course the club was a strange one, both of my own being closed for cleaning, a coincidence expressly planned by Providence for my inconvenience. The club which you are permitted to make use of, on these occasions, always irritates with its strangeness and discomfort. The few occupants seem odd and oddly dressed, and you wonder how they got there. The particular weekly that you want is not taken in, the dinner is execrable, and the ventilation a farce. All these evils oppressed me to-night, and yet I was puzzled to find that somewhere within me there was a faint lightening of the spirits, causeless as far as I could discover. It could not be Davis's letter. Yachting in the Baltic at the end of September. The very idea made one shudder. Cows, with a pleasant party and hotels handy, was all very well. An August cruise on a steam yacht in French waters or the Highlands was all very well, but what kind of a yacht was this? It must be of a certain size to have got so far, but I thought I remembered enough of Davis's means to know that he had no money to waste on luxuries. That brought me to the man himself. I had known him at Oxford, not as one of my immediate set, 
But we were a sociable college, and I had seen a good deal of him, liking him for his physical energy, combined with a certain simplicity and modesty, though indeed he had nothing to be conceited about, liked him, in fact, in the way that at that receptive period one likes many men whom one never keeps up with later. We had both gone down in the same year, three years ago now. I had gone to France and Germany for two years to learn the languages. He had failed for the Indian Civil, and then had gone into a solicitor's office. I had only seen him since at rare intervals, though I admitted to myself that for his part he had clung loyally to what ties of friendship there were between us. But the truth was that we had drifted apart from the nature of things. I had passed brilliantly into my profession, and on the few occasions I had met him since I made my triumphant debut in society, I had found nothing left in common between us. He seemed to know none of my friends, he dressed indifferently, and I thought him dull. I had always connected him with boats and the sea, but never with yachting, in the sense that I understood it. In college days, he had nearly persuaded me into sharing a squalid week in some open boat he had picked up, and was going to sail among some dreary mud flats somewhere on the east coast. There was nothing else, and the funereal function at dinner drifted on. But I found myself remembering at the entree that I had recently heard, at second or third hand, of something else about him, exactly what I could not recall. When I reached the savoury, I had concluded, as far as I had centred my mind on it at all, that the whole thing was a culminating irony, as indeed was the savoury in its way. After the wreck of my pleasant plans and the fiasco of my martyrdom, to be asked as consolation to spend October freezing in the Baltic with an eccentric non-entity who bored me. Yet, as I smoked my cigar in the ghastly splendour of the empty smoking-room, the subject came up again. Was there anything in it? There were certainly no alternatives at hand, and to bury myself in the Baltic at this unearthly time of year had at least a smack of tragic thoroughness about it. I pulled out the letter again, and ran down its impulsive staccato sentences, affecting to ignore what a gust of fresh air, high spirits and good fellowship this flimsy bit of paper wafted into the jaded club-room. On re-perusal, it was full of evil presage. A1 scenery. But what of equinoctial storms and October fogs? Every sane yachtsman was paying off his crew now. There ought to be duck. Vague, very vague. If it gets cold enough, cold and yachting seemed to be a gratuitously monstrous union. His pals had left him. Why? not the yachting brand, and why not? As to the size, comfort, and crew of the yacht, all cheerfully ignored, so many maddening blanks. And, by the way, why in heaven's name a prismatic compass? I fingered a few magazines, played a game of fifty with a friendly old fogey, too importunate to be worth the labour of resisting, and went back to my chambers to bed, ignorant that a friendly providence had come to my rescue, and indeed rather resenting any clumsy attempt at such friendliness. End of chapter 1 Recorded by Gesine in April 2007
while it left me free to enjoy myself unobtrusively in the remote event of enjoyment being possible. The fact was that, at breakfast on the morning after the arrival of the letter, I had still found that inexplicable lightning which I mentioned before, and strong enough to warrant a revival of the pros and cons. An important pro, which I had not thought of before, was that after all it was a good-natured piece of unselfishness to join Davis, for he had spoken of the want of a pal, and seemed honestly to be in need of me. I almost clutched at this consideration. It was an admirable excuse, when I reached my office that day, for a resigned study on the Continental Bradshaw, and an order to Carter to unroll a great creaking wall-map of Germany, and find me Flensburg. The latter labour I might have saved him, but it was good for Carter to have something to do, and his patient ignorance was amusing. With most of the map and what it suggested, I was tolerably familiar, for I had not wasted my year in Germany, whatever I had done or not done since. Its people, history, progress and future had interested me intensely, and I had still friends in Dresden and Berlin. Flensburg recalled the Danish War of 64, and by the time Carter's researches had ended in success, I had forgotten the task set him, and was wondering whether the prospect of seeing something of that lovely region of Schleswig-Holstein, as I knew from hearsay that it was, was at all to be set against such an uncomfortable way of seeing it, with the season so late, the company so unattractive, and all the other drawbacks which I counted and treasured as proofs of my desperate condition, if I were to go. It needed little to decide me, and I think Kay's arrival from Switzerland, offensively sunburnt, was the finishing touch. His greeting was, "'Hallo, Carruthers, you there? Thought you had got away long ago. Lucky devil, though, to be going now, just in time for the best driving, and the early pheasants. The heat's been shocking out there. Carter, bring me a Bradshaw.' An extraordinary book, Bradshaw, turned to from habit, even when least wanted, as men fondle guns and rods in the close season. By lunchtime the weight of indecision had been removed, and I found myself entrusting Carter with a telegram to Davis, P.O. Flensburg. Thanks. Expect me 9.34 p.m. 26th. Which produced, three hours later, a reply. Delighted. Please bring a number three ripping gill stove. A perplexing and ominous direction, which somehow chilled me in spite of its subject matter. Indeed, my resolution was continually faltering. It faltered when I turned out my gun in the evening and thought of the grouse it ought to have accounted for. It faltered again when I contemplated the miscellaneous list of commissions sown broadcast through Davis's letter, to fulfil which seemed to make me a willing tool, where my chosen role was that of an embittered exile, or at least a condescending ally. However, I faced the commissions manfully, after leaving the office. At Lancaster's I inquired for his gun, was received coolly, and had to pay a heavy bill, which it seemed to have incurred, before it was handed over. Having ordered the gun and number fours to be sent to my chambers, I bought the raven mixture with that peculiar sense of injury which the prospect of smuggling in another's behalf always entails, and wondered where in the world Carey and Nielsen's was, a firm which Davis spoke of as though it were as well known as the Bank of England or the stores, instead of specialising in rigging screws, whatever they might be. They sounded important, though, and it would be only polite to unearth them. I connected them with a few repairs, and awoke new misgivings. At the stores I asked for a number three ripping gill stove, and was confronted with a formidable and hideous piece of ironmongery, which burned petroleum in two capacious tanks, horribly prophetic of a smell of warm oil. I paid for this miserably, convinced of its grim efficiency, but speculating as to the domestic conditions which caused it to be sent for as an afterthought by telegram. I also asked about the rigging screws in the yachting department, but learned that they were not kept in stock, 
that Carey and Nielsen's would certainly have them, and that their shop was in the minories in the Far East, meaning a journey nearly as long as to Flensburg and twice as tiresome. They would be shut by the time I got there, so after this exhausting round of duty I went home in a cab, omitted dressing for dinner, an epoch in itself, ordered the chop up from the basement kitchen, and spent the rest of the evening packing and writing, with the methodical gloom of a man setting his affairs in order for the last time. The last of those airless nights passed. The astonished Withers saw me breakfasting at eight, and at nine-thirty I was vacantly examining rigging screws with what wits were left me after a sulphurous ride in the underground to Aldgate. I laid great stress on the three-eighths and the galvanism and took them on trust, ignorant as to their functions. For the eleven shilling oilskins I was referred to a villainous den in a back street, which the shopman said they always recommended, and where a dirty and bejeweled Hebrew chaffered with me, beginning at eighteen shillings, over two reeking orange slabs distantly resembling moieties of the human figure. Their odour made me close prematurely for fourteen shillings, and I hurried back, for I was due there at eleven, to my office with my two disreputable brown paper parcels, one of which made itself so noticeable in the close official air that Carter attentively asked if I would like to have it sent to my chambers, and K was inquisitive to bluntness about it and my movements. But I did not care to enlighten K, whose comments I knew would be provokingly envious or wounding to my pride in some way. I remembered later on the prismatic compass, and wired to the minories to have one sent at once, feeling rather relieved that I was not present there to be cross-examined as to size and make. The reply was, Not stopped. Try surveying instrument maker. A reply both puzzling and reassuring, for Davis's request for a compass had given me more uneasiness than anything, while to find that what he wanted turned out to be a surveying instrument was a no less perplexing discovery. That day I made my last précis, and handed over my schedules, Procrustean beds, where unwilling facts were stretched and tortured, and said good-bye to my temporary chief, genial and lenient M., who wished me a jolly holiday with all sincerity. At seven I was watching a cab packed with my personal luggage, and the collection of unwieldy and incongruous packages that my shopping had drawn down to me. Two deviations after that wretched prismatic compass, which I obtained in the end second-hand, Fort de Mieux, near Victoria, at one of those showy shops which look like jewellers and are really pawnbrokers, nearly caused me to miss my train. But at eight-thirty I had shaken off the dust of London from my feet, and at ten-thirty I was, as I have announced, pacing the deck of a flushing steamer, adrift on this fatuous holiday in the far Baltic. An air from the west, cooled by a midday thunderstorm, followed the steamer as she slid through the calm channels of the Thames estuary, past the cordon of scintillating lightships that watch over the sea roads to the imperial city, like pickets round a sleeping army, and slipped out into the dark spaces of the North Sea. Stars were bright, summer scents from the Kent cliffs mingled coyly with vulgar steamer smells. The summer weather held immutably. Nature, for her part, seemed resolved to be no party to my penance, but to be imperturbably bent on shedding mild ridicule over my wrongs. An irresistible sense of peace and detachment, combined with that delicious physical awakening that pulses through the nerve-sick townsman when city airs and bald routine are left behind him, combined to provide me, however thankless a subject, with a solid background of resignation. Stowing this safely away, I could calculate my intentions with cold egotism. If the weather held, I might pass a not intolerable fortnight with Davis. When it broke up, as it was sure to, I could easily excuse myself from the pursuit of the problematical ducks. The wintry logic of facts would, in any case, decide him to lay up his yacht, 
for he could scarcely think of sailing home at such a season. I could then take a chance, lying ready of spending a few weeks in Dresden or elsewhere. I settled this programme comfortably, and then turned in. From flushing eastward to Hamburg, then northward to Flensburg, I cut short the next day's sultry story. Past dike and windmill and still canals, onto blazing stubbles and roaring towns, at the last, after dusk, through a quiet level region where the train pottered from one lazy little station to another, and at ten o'clock I found myself, stiff and stuffy, on the platform at Flensburg, exchanging greetings with Davis. It's awfully good of you to come. Not at all, it's very good of you to ask me. We were both of us ill at ease. Even in the dim gaslight he clashed on my notions of a yachtsman. No cool white ducks, or neat blue serge. And where was the snowy crown yachting cap, that precious charm that so easily converts a landsman into a dashing mariner? Conscious that this impressive uniform, in high perfection, was lying ready in my portmanteau, I felt oddly guilty. He wore an old Norfolk jacket, muddy brown shoes, grey flannel trousers, or had they been white? and an ordinary tweed cap. The hand he gave me was horny, and appeared to be stained with paint. The other one, which carried a parcel, had a bandage on it which would have borne renewal. There was an instant of mutual inspection. I thought he gave me a shy, hurried scrutiny, as though to test past conjectures, with something of anxiety in it, and perhaps, save the mark, a tinge of admiration. The face was familiar, and yet not familiar, the pleasant blue eyes, open, clean-cut features, unintellectual forehead were the same, so were the brisk and impulsive movements. There was some change, but the moment of awkward hesitation was over, and the light was bad, and while strolling down the platform for my luggage, we chatted with constraint about trivial things. By the way, he suddenly said, laughing. I'm afraid I'm not fit to be seen, but it's so late it doesn't matter. I've been painting hard all day, and just got it finished. I only hope we shall have some wind tomorrow. It's been hopelessly calm lately. I say, you've brought a good deal of stuff, he concluded as my belongings began to collect. Here was a reward for my submissive exertions in the Far East. You gave me a good many commissions. Oh, I didn't mean those things, he said absently. Thanks for bringing them, by the way. That's the stove, I suppose. Cartridges, this one, by the weight. You got the rigging screws all right, I hope? They're not really necessary, of course. I nodded vacantly and felt a little hurt. But they're simpler than lanyards, and you can't get them here. It's that portmanteau he said slowly, measuring it with a doubtful eye. Never mind, we'll try. You couldn't do with a Gladstone only, I suppose. You see the dinghy, hmm, and there's the hatchway, too. He was lost in thought. Anyhow, we'll try. I'm afraid there are no cabs, but it's quite near, and the porter will help. Sickening forebodings crept over me, while Davis shouldered my Gladstone and clutched at the parcels. "'Aren't your men here?' I asked faintly. "'Men?' he looked confused. "'Oh, perhaps I ought to have told you. I never have any paid hands. It's quite a small boat, you know. I hope you didn't expect luxury. I've managed her single-handed for some time. A man would be no use, and a horrible nuisance.' He revealed these appalling truths— with a cheerful assurance, which did nothing to hide a naive apprehension of their effect on me. There was a check in our mobilization. "'It's rather late to go on board, isn't it?' I said in a wooden voice. Someone was turning out the gaslights, and the porter yawned ostentatiously. "'I think I'd rather sleep at a hotel tonight.' A strained pause. "'Oh!' "'Of course you can do that if you like,' said Davis, in transparent distress of mind. 
but it seems hardly worth while to cart this stuff all the way to an hotel. I believe they're all on the other side of the harbour, and back again to the boat tomorrow. She's quite comfortable, and you're sure to sleep well, as you're tired. We can leave the things here, I argued feebly, and walk over with my bag. Oh, I shall have to go aboard anyhow, he rejoined. I never sleep on shore. He seemed to be clinging timidly but desperately to some diplomatic end. A stony despair was invading me and paralyzing resistance. Better face the worst and be done with it. Come on, I said grimly. Heavily loaded, we stumbled over railway lines and rubble heaps and came on the harbour. Davis led the way to a stairway whose weedy steps disappeared below in gloom. If you'll get into the dinghy, he said, all briskness now, I'll pass the things down. I descended gingerly, holding as a guide a sodden painter, which ended in a small boat, and conscious that I was collecting slime on cuffs and trousers. Hold up! shouted Davis cheerfully, as I sat down suddenly near the bottom, with one foot in the water. I climbed wretchedly into the dinghy, and awaited events. Now float her up close under the key wall, and make fast to the ring down there, came down from above, followed by the slack of the sodden painter, which knocked my cap off as it fell. All fast? Any knot'll do, I heard, as I grappled with his loathsome task, and then a big dark object loomed overhead and was lowered into the dinghy. It was my portmanteau, and, placed athwart, exactly filled all the space amidships. "'Does it fit?' was the anxious inquiry from aloft. "'Beautifully!' "'Capital!' Scratching at the greasy wall to keep the dinghy close to it, I received in succession our stores, and stowed the cargo as best I could, while the dinghy sank lower and lower in the water, and its precarious superstructure grew higher. Catch! was the final direction from above, and a damp soft parcel hit me in the chest. Be careful of that, it's meat. Now back to the stairs. I painfully acquiesced, and Davis appeared. It's a bit of a load, and she's rather deep, but I think we shall manage, he reflected. You sit right aft, and I'll row. I was too far gone for curiosity as to how this monstrous pyramid was to be rowed, or even for surmises as to its foundering by the way. I crawled to my appointed seat, and Davies extricated the buried skulls by a series of tugs, which shook the whole structure and made us roll alarmingly. How he stowed himself into rowing posture I have not the least idea but eventually we were moving sluggishly out into the open water, his head just visible in the bows. We had started from what appeared to be the head of a narrow loch, and were leaving behind us the lights of a big town. A long frontage of lamp-lit quays was on our left, with here and there the vague hull of a steamer alongside. We passed the last of the lights, and came out into a broader stretch of water, when a light breeze was blowing, and dark hills could be seen on either shore. "'I'm lying a little way down the fjord, you see,' said Davies. "'I hate to be too near a town, and I found a carpenter handy here. There she is. I wonder how you'll like her.' I roused myself. We were entering a little cove encircled by trees, and approaching a light which flickered in the rigging of a small vessel— whose outline gradually defined itself. "'Keep her off,' said Davies, as we drew alongside. In a moment he had jumped on deck, tied the painter, and was round at my end. "'You hand them up,' he ordered, "'and I'll take them.' It was a laborious task, with the one relief that it was not far to hand them, a doubtful compensation— for other reasons distantly shaping themselves. When the stack was transferred to the deck, I followed it, 
tripping over the flabby meat parcel, which was already showing ghastly signs of disintegration under the dew. Hastily, there floated through my mind my last embarkation on a yacht, my faultless attire, the trim gig and obsequious sailors, the accommodation ladder flashing with varnish and brass in the August sun, the orderly snowy decks and basket chairs under the awning aft. What a contrast with this sordid midnight scramble over damp meat and littered packing cases. The bitterest touch of all was a growing sense of inferiority and ignorance which I had never before been allowed to feel in my experience of yachts. Davies awoke from another reverie over my portmanteau to say, cheerily, I'll just show you round down below first, and then we'll stow things away and get to bed. He dived down the companion ladder, and I followed cautiously. A complex odour of paraffin, past cookery, tobacco, and tar saluted my nostrils. Mind your head, said Davies, striking a match and lighting a candle, while I groped into the cabin. You'd better sit down. It's easier to look around. There might well have been sarcasm in this piece of advice, for I must have cut a ridiculous figure, peering awkwardly and suspiciously round, with shoulders and head bent, to avoid the ceiling, which seemed in the half-light to be even nearer the floor than it was. You see, were Davis's reassuring words, there's plenty of room to sit upright. Which was strictly true, but I am not very tall, and he is short. Some people make a point of headroom, but I never mind much about it. That's the centreboard case, he explained, as in stretching my legs out, my knees came into contact with a sharp edge. I had not seen this devilish obstruction as it was hidden beneath the table, which indeed rested on it at one end. It appeared to be a long, low triangle, running lengthways with the boat, and dividing the naturally limited space into two. You see, she's a flat-bottomed boat, drawing very little water without the plate. That's why there's so little headroom. For deep water you lower the plate, so in one way or another you can go practically anywhere. I was not nautical enough to draw any very definite conclusions from this, but what I did draw were not promising. The latter sentences were spoken from the forecastle, whither Davies had crept through a low sliding door, like that of a rabbit hutch, and was already busy with a kettle over a stove, which I made out to be a battered and disreputable twin brother of the number three ripping gale. "'It'll be boiling soon,' he remarked, "'and we'll have some grog.' My eyes were used to the light now, and I took in the rest of my surroundings, which may be very simply described. Two long, cushion-covered seats flanked the cabin, bounded at the after end by cupboards, one of which was cut low to form a sort of miniature sideboard, with glasses hung on a rack above it. The deck overhead was very low at each side, but rose shoulder-high for a space in the middle, where a coach-house roof, with a skylight, gave additional cabin space. Just outside the door was a fold-up washing-stand. On either wall were long net-racks, holding a medley of flags, charts, caps, cigar-boxes, hanks of yarn, and such like. Across the forward bulkhead was a bookshelf, crammed to overflowing with volumes of all sizes, many upside down and some coverless. Below this were a pipe-rack, an aneroid, and a clock with a hearty tick. All the woodwork was painted white, and to a less jaundiced eye than mine, the interior might have had an enticing look of snugness. Some Kodak prints were nailed roughly on the after bulkhead, and just over the doorway was the photograph of a young girl. "'That's my sister,' says Davies, who had emerged and saw me looking at it. "'Now, let's get the stuff down.' He ran up the ladder, and soon my portmanteau blackened the hatchway, and a great straining and squeezing began. "'I was afraid it was too big,' came down. "'I'm sorry, but you'll have to unpack on deck. 
"'We may be able to squash it down when it's empty.' Then the wearisome tale of packages began to form a fresh stack in the cramped space at my feet, and my back ached with stooping and moiling in unfamiliar places. Davies came down, and with unconcealed pride introduced me to the sleeping cabin. He called the other one the saloon. Another candle was lit, and showed two short and narrow berths with blankets, but no sign of sheets. Beneath these were drawers, one set of which Davies made me master of, evidently thinking them a princely allowance for space for my wardrobe. "'You can chuck your things down the skylight onto your berth as you unpack them,' he remarked. "'By the way, I doubt if there's room for all you've got. I suppose you couldn't manage—' "'No, I couldn't,' I said shortly. The absurdity of argument struck me. Two men, doubled up like monkeys, cannot argue.' "'If you'll go out, I shall be able to get out, too,' I added. "'He seemed miserable at this ghost of an altercation, "'but I pushed past, mounted the ladder, "'and in the expiring moonlight unstrapped that accursed portmanteau, "'and, brimming over with irritation, "'groped among its contents, sorting some into the skylight, "'with the same feeling that nothing mattered much now, "'and it was best to be done with it. "'Repacking the rest with guilty stealth, ere Davies should discover their character, and strapping up the hole again. Then I sat down upon my white elephant and shivered, for the chill of autumn was in the air. It suddenly struck me that if it had been raining, things might have been worse still. The notion made me look round. The little cove was still as glass, stars above and stars below, a few white cottages glimmering at one point on the shore. In the west, the lights of Flensburg. To the east, the fjords broadening into unknown gloom. From Davies toiling below, there were muffled sounds of wrenching, pushing and hammering, punctuated occasionally by a heavy splash as something shot up from the hatchway and fell into the water. How it came about, I do not know whether it was something pathetic in the look I had last seen on his face, a look which I associated for no reason whatever with his bandaged hand, whether it was one of those instants of clear vision in which our separate selves are seen divided, the baser from the better, and I saw my silly egotism in contrast with a simple generous nature, whether it was an impalpable air of mystery which pervaded the whole enterprise, and refused to be dissipated by its most mortifying and vulgarizing incidents. A mystery dimly connected with my companion's obvious consciousness of having misled me into joining him. Whether it was only the stars and the cool air rousing atrophied instincts of youth and spirits, probably indeed it was all these influences, cemented into strength by a ruthless sense of humor, which whispered that I was in danger of making a mere commonplace fool of myself, in spite of all my laboured calculations. But whatever it was, in a flash my mood changed. The crown of martyrdom disappeared, the wounded vanity healed, that precious fund of fictitious resignation drained away, but left no void. There was left a fashionable and dishevelled young man, sitting in the dew and in the dark, on a ridiculous portmanteau which dwarfed the yacht that was to carry it, a youth acutely sensible of ignorance in a strange and strenuous atmosphere, still feeling sore and victimized, but withal sanely ashamed and sanely resolved to enjoy himself. I anticipate, for though the change was radical, its full growth was slow. But in any case it was here and now that it took its birth. "'Grog's ready!' came from below. Bunching myself for the descent, I found, to my astonishment, that all trace of litter had miraculously vanished, and a cosy neatness reigned. Glasses and lemons were on the table, and a fragrant smell of punch had deadened previous odours. I showed little emotion at these amenities, but enough to give intense relief to Davies, who delightedly showed me his devices for storage, praising the roominess of his floating den. "'There's your stove, you see,' 
he ended. I've chucked the old one overboard. It was a weakness of his, I should say here, to rejoice in throwing things overboard, on the flimsiest pretexts. I afterwards suspected that the new stove had not been really necessary any more than the rigging screws, but was an excuse for gratifying this curious taste. We smoked and chatted for a little, and then came the problem of going to bed. After much bumping of knuckles and head, and many giddy writhings, I mastered it, and lay between the rough blankets. Davies, moving swiftly and deftly, was soon in his. "'It's quite comfortable, isn't it?' he said, as he blew out the light from where he lay, with an accuracy which must have been the fruit of long practice. I felt prickly all over, and there was a damp patch on the pillow, which was soon explained by the heavy drop of moisture falling on my forehead. "'I suppose the deck's not leaking?' I said as mildly as I could. "'I'm awfully sorry,' said Davis, earnestly, tumbling out of his bunk. "'It must be the heavy dew. "'I did a lot of caulking yesterday, but I suppose I missed that place. "'I'll run up and square it with an oilskin.' "'What's wrong with your hand?' I asked sleepily on his return, "'for gratitude reminded me of that bandage. "'Nothing much. I strained it the other day.' was the reply, and then the seemingly inconsequent remark, I'm glad you brought that prismatic compass. It's not really necessary, of course, but, muffled by blankets, it may come in useful. End of chapter 2 Recorded by Gesine in May 2007《The Riddle of the Sands》This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine The Riddle of the Sands by Erskine Childers Chapter 3 Davies I dozed but fitfully, with a fretful sense of sore elbows and neck and many a draughty hiatus among the blankets. It was broad daylight before I had reached the stage of torpor in which such slumber merges. That was finally broken by the descent through the skylight of a torrent of water. I started up, bumped my head hard against the decks, and blinked leaden-eyed upwards. Sorry, I'm scrubbing decks. Come up and bathe. Slept well? I heard a voice saying from aloft. Fairly well, I growled, stepping out into a pool of water on the oilcloth. Thence I stumbled up the ladder, dived overboard, and buried bad dreams, stiffness, frowsiness, and tormented nerves on the loveliest fjord of the lovely Baltic. A short and furious swim, and I was back again, and searching for a means of ascent, up the smooth black side, which, low as it was, was slippery and unsympathetic. Davies, in a loose canvas shirt, with the sleeves tucked up and flannels rolled up to the knee, hung over me with a rope's end and chatted unconcernedly about the easiness of the job when you know how, adjuring me to mind the paint and talking about an accommodation ladder he had once had but had thrown overboard because it was so horribly in the way. When I arrived, my knees and elbows were picked out in black paint, to his consternation. Nevertheless, as I plied the towel, I knew that I had left in those limpid depths yet another crust of discontent and self-conceit. As I dressed into flannels and blazer, I looked round the deck, and with an unskilled and doubtful eye, took in all that the darkness had hitherto hidden. She seemed very small, in point of fact, she was seven tons, something over thirty feet in length and nine in beam, a size very suitable to weekends in the Solent, for such as liked that sort of thing. But that she should have come from Dover to the Baltic suggested a world of physical endeavour of which I had never dreamed. I passed to the aesthetic side. 
Smartness and beauty were essential to yachts in my mind, but with the best resolves to be pleased, I found little encouragement here. The hull seemed too low, and the mainmast too high. The cabin roof looked clumsy, and the skylights saddened the eye with dull iron and plebeian graining. What a brass there was, on the tiller head and elsewhere, was tarnished with sickly green. The decks had none of that creamy purity which cows expects, but were rough and grey, and showed tarry exhalations round the seams, and rusty stains near the bows. The ropes and rigging were in mourning when contrasted with the delicate buff manilla, so satisfying to the artistic eye as seen against the blue of a June sky at South Sea. Nor was the whole effect bettered by many signs of recent refitting. An impression of paint, varnish, and carpentry was in the air. A gaudy new burgee fluttered aloft. There seemed to be a new rope or two, especially round the diminutive mizzen mast, which itself looked altogether new. But all this only emphasized the general plainness, reminding one of a respectable woman of the working classes trying to dress above her station, and soon likely to give it up. That the ensemble was business-like and solid, even my untrained eye could see. Many of the deck fittings seemed disproportionately substantial. The anchor chain looked contemptuous of its charge. The binnacle with its compass was of a size and prominence almost comically impressive, and was, moreover, the only piece of brass which was burnished and showed traces of reverend care. Two huge coils of stout and dingy warp lay just abaft the mainmast, and summed up the weather-beaten aspect of the little ship. I should add here that in the distant past she had been a lifeboat, and had been clumsily converted into a yacht by the addition of a counter, deck, and the necessary spars. She was built, as all lifeboats are, diagonally of two skins of teak, and thus had immense strength, though in the matter of looks, all a hybrid's failings. Hunger and tea's made, from below brought me down to the cabin, where I found breakfast laid out on the table over the centreboard case, with Davies earnestly presiding, rather flushed as to the face, and sooty as to the fingers. There was a slight shortage of plate and crockery, but I praised the bacon and could do so truthfully, for its crisp and steaming shavings would put to shame the efforts of my London cook. Indeed, I should have enjoyed the meal heartily, were it not for the lowness of the sofa and table, causing a curvature of the body which made swallowing a more lengthy process than usual, and induced a periodical yearning to get up and stretch, a relief which spelt disaster to the skull. I noticed, too, that Davies spoke with a zest, sinister to me, of the delights of white bread and fresh milk, which he seemed to consider unusual luxuries though suitable to an inaugural banquet in honour of a fastidious stranger. "'One can't be always going on shore,' he said, when I showed a discreet interest in these things. "'I lived for ten days on a big rye loaf over in the Frisian Islands.' "'And it died hard, I suppose?' "'Very hard, but,' gravely, "'quite good. "'After that I taught myself to make rolls,' "'had no baking powder at first, so used Eno's fruit salt. "'But they wouldn't rise much with that. "'As for milk, condensed is. "'I hope you don't mind it.' "'I changed the subject and asked about his plans. "'Let's get under way at once,' he said, "'and sail down the fjord. "'I tried for something more specific, "'but he was gone and his voice drowned in the forecastle by the clatter and swish of washing up. Thenceforward, events moved with bewildering rapidity. Humbly desirous of being useful, I joined him on deck, only to find that he scarcely noticed me, save as a new and unexpected obstacle in his round of activity. He was everywhere at once, heaving in chain, hooking on halyards, hauling ropes, while my part became that of the clown who does things after they are already done, for my knowledge of a yacht was of that floating and inaccurate kind which is useless in practice. Soon the anchor was up, a great rusty monster it was, 
the sails set, and Davies was darting swiftly to and fro between the tiller and jib sheets, while the Dulcibella bowed a lingering farewell to the shore and headed for the open fjord. Erratic puffs from the high land behind made her progress timorous at first, but soon the fairway was reached, and a true breeze from Flensburg and the west took her in its friendly grip. Steadily she rustled down the calm blue highway, whose soft beauty was the introduction to a passage in my life, short but pregnant with moulding force, through stress and strain for me and others. Davies was gradually resuming his natural self, with abstracted intervals, in which he lashed the helm to finger a distant rope, with such speed that the movements seemed simultaneous. Once he vanished, only to reappear in an instant with a chart, which he studied while steering, with a success that its reluctant folds seemed to render impossible. Waiting respectfully for his revival, I had full time to look about. The fjord here was about a mile broad. From the shore we had left, the hills rose steeply, but with no rugged grandeur. The outlines were soft, there were green spaces and rich woods on the lower slopes. A little white town was opening up in one place, and scattered farms dotted the prospect. The other shore, which I could just see, framed between the gunwale and the mainsail, as I sat leaning against the hatchway, and sadly missing a deck-chair, was lower and lonelier, though prosperous and pleasing to the eye. Spacious pastures led up by slow degrees, to ordered clusters of wood, which hinted at the presence of some great manor-house. Behind us, Flensburg was settling into haze. Ahead, the scene was shut in by the contours of hills, some clear, some dreamy and distant. Lastly, a single glimpse of water shining between the folds of hill far away hinted at spaces of distant sea, of which this was but a secluded inlet." Everywhere was that peculiar charm engendered by the association of quiet pastoral country and a homely human atmosphere with a branch of the great ocean that bathes all the shores of our globe. There was another charm in the scene, due to the way in which I was viewing it, not as a pampered passenger on a fine steam yacht, or even on a powerful modern schooner, as the yacht agents advertise, but from the deck of a scrubby little craft of doubtful build and distressing plainness, which yet had smelt her persistent way to this distant fjord, through a new not what of difficulty and danger, with no apparent motive in her single occupant, who talked as vaguely and unconcernedly about his adventurous cruise as though it were all a protracted afternoon on Southampton water. I glanced around at Davies. He had dropped the chart and was sitting, or rather half lying, on the deck with one bronzed arm over the tiller, gazing fixedly ahead, with just an occasional glance around and aloft. He still seemed absorbed in himself, and for a moment or two I studied his face with an attention I had never, since I had known him, given it. I had always thought it commonplace, as I had thought him commonplace, so far as I had thought at all about either. It had always rather irritated me by an excess of candour and boyishness. These qualities it had kept, but the scales were falling from my eyes, and I saw others. I saw strength to obstinacy, and courage to recklessness, in the firm lines of the chin, an older and deeper look in the eyes. Those odd transitions from bright mobility to detached earnestness, which had partly amused and chiefly annoyed me hitherto, seemed now to be lost in a sensitive reserve, not cold or egotistic, but strangely winning from its paradoxical frankness. Sincerity was stamped on every lineament. A deep misgiving stirred me that, clever as I thought myself, nicely perceptive of the right and congenial men to know, I had made some big mistakes. How many, I wondered. A relief scarcely less deep, because it was unconfessed, stole in on me, with a suspicion that, little as I deserved it, the patient fates were offering me a golden chance of repairing at least one. And yet, I mused, the patient fates have crooked methods, besides a certain mischievous humour, 
for it was Davies who had asked me out, though now he scarcely seemed to need me, almost tricked me into coming out, for he might have known I was not suited to such a life. Yet trickery and Davies sounded an odd conjuncture. Probably it was the growing discomfort of my attitude which produced this backsliding. My night's rest and the ascent from the bath had, in fact, done little to prepare me for contact with sharp edges and hard surfaces. But Davies had suddenly come to himself, and with an, "'I say, are you comfortable? Have something to sit on?' jerked the helm a little to windward, felt it like a pulse for a moment, with a rapid look to windward, and dived below, whence he returned with a couple of cushions which he threw to me. I felt perversely resentful of these luxuries, and asked, "'Can't I be of any use?' "'Oh, don't bother,' he answered. "'I expect you're tired. Aren't we having a splendid sail? This must be Ekin on the port bow,' peering under the sail, where the trees run in. "'I say, do you mind looking at the chart?' He tossed it over to me. I spread it out painfully, for it curled up like a watch-spring at the least slackening of pressure. I was not familiar with charts, and this sudden trust reposed in me, after a good deal of neglect, made me nervous. "'You see Flensburg, don't you?' he said. "'That's where we are,' dabbing with a long reach at an indefinite space on the crowded sheet. "'Now, which side of that boy off the point do we pass?' I had scarcely taken in which was land and which was water, much less the significance of the boy, when he resumed, "'Never mind, I'm pretty sure it's all deep water about here. I expect that marks the fairway for steamers.' In a minute or two we were passing the boy in question. On the wrong side, I am pretty certain, for weeds and sand came suddenly into view below us with uncomfortable distinctness. But all Davis said was, "'There's never any sea here, and the plate's not down.' "'A dark utterance, which I pondered doubtfully. "'The best of these Schleswig waters,' he went on, "'is that a boat of this size can go almost anywhere. "'There's no navigation required. "'Why?' "'At this moment a faint scraping was felt, rather than heard, beneath us. "'Aren't we aground?' I asked, with great calmness. "'Oh, she'll blow over,' he replied, wincing a little. "'She blew over, but the episode caused a little naive vexation in Davies. "'I related as a good instance of one of his minor peculiarities. "'He was utterly without that didactic pedantry "'which yachting has a fatal tendency to engender in men who profess it. "'He had tossed me the chart without a thought that I was an ignoramus, "'to whom it would be Greek.' and who would provide him with an admirable subject to drill and lecture, just as his neglect of me throughout the morning had been merely habitual and unconscious independence. In the second place, master of his métier, as I knew him afterwards to be, resourceful, skilful, and alert, he was liable to lapse into a certain amateurish vagueness, half irritating and half amusing. I think truly that both these peculiarities came from the same source, a hatred of any sort of affectation. To the same source I traced the fact that he and his yacht observed none of the superficial etiquette of yachts and yachtsmen, that she never, for instance, flew a national ensign, and he never wore a yachting suit. We rounded a low green point, which I had scarcely noticed before. "'We must jibe,' said Davis. "'Just take the helm, will you?' and without waiting for my cooperation, he began hauling in the mainsheet with great vigour. I had rude notions of steering, but driving is a delicate operation. No yachtsman will be surprised to hear that the boom saw its opportunity and swung over with a mighty crash, with the mainsheet entangled round me and the tiller. "'Dribed all standing,' was his sorrowful comment. "'You're not used to her yet. She's very quick on the helm.' "'Where am I to steer for?' I asked wildly. "'Oh, don't trouble, I'll take her now,' he replied. "'I felt it was time to make my position clear. "'I'm an utter duffer at sailing,' I began. "'You'll have a lot to teach me, or one of these days I shall be wrecking you. 
You see, there's always been a crew. Crew, with sovereign contempt. Why, the whole fun of the thing is to do everything oneself. Well, I felt in the way the whole morning. I'm awfully sorry. His dismay and repentance were comical. Why, it's just the other way. You may be all the use in the world. He became absent. We were following the inward trend of a small bay towards a cleft in the low shore. That's Ecken Sound, said Davies. Let's look into it. And a minute or two later we were drifting through a dainty little strait with a peep of open water at the end of it. Cottages bordered either side, some overhanging the very water, some connecting with it by a rickety wooden staircase or a miniature landing stage. Creepers and roses rioted over the walls and tiny porches. For a space on one side, a rude quay with small smacks floating off it spoke of some minute commercial interests. A very small tea garden with neglected-looking bowers and leaf-strewn tables hinted at some equally minute tripping interest. A pervading hue of mingled bronze and rose came partly from the water-mellowed woodwork of the cottages and stages, and partly from the creepers and the trees behind, where autumn's subtle fingers were already at work. Down this exquisite sea lane we glided till it ended in a broad mere, where our sails, which had been shivering and complaining, filled into contented silence. "'Ready about,' said Davies callously. "'We must get out of this again.' And round we swung. "'Why not anchor and stop here?' I protested, for a view of tantalizing loveliness was unfolding itself. "'Oh, we've seen all there is to be seen, and we must take this breeze while we've got it. It was always torture to Davies to feel a good breeze running to waste while he was inactive at anchor or on shore. The shore, to him, was an inferior element, merely serving as a useful annex to the water, a source of necessary supplies.' Let's have lunch, he pursued, as we resumed our way down the fjord. A vision of iced drinks, tempting salads, white napery, and an attentive steward mocked me with past recollections. You'll find a tongue, said the voice of doom, in the starboard sofa locker, beer under the floor in the bilge. I'll see her round that boy, if you wouldn't mind beginning. I obeyed with a bad grace but the close air and cramped posture must have benumbed my faculties, for I opened the port-side locker, reached down, and grasped a sticky body which turned out to be a pot of varnish. Recoiling wretchedly, I tried the opposite one, combating the embarrassing heel of the boat and the obstructive edges of the centreboard case. A medley of damp tins of varied sizes showed in the gloom, exuding a mouldy odour. Faded legends on dissolving paper, like the remnants of old posters on a disused hoarding, spoke of soups, curries, beefs, potted meats and other hidden delicacies. I picked out a tongue, re-imprisoned the odour, and explored for beer. It was true, I supposed, that bilge didn't hurt it, as I tugged at the plank on my hands and knees, but I should have myself preferred a more accessible and less humid wine cellar than the cavities among slimy ballast from which I dug the bottles. I regarded my hard-won and ill-favoured pledges of a meal with giddiness and discouragement. "'How are you getting on?' shouted Davies. "'The tin opener's hanging up on the bulkhead. The plates and knives are in the cupboard.' I doggedly pursued my functions. The plates and knives met me halfway, for being on the weather side, and thus having a downward slant— its contents, when I slipped the hatch, slid affectionately into my bosom and overflowed with a clatter and jingle onto the floor. "'That often happens,' I heard from above. "'Never mind. There are no breakables. I'm coming down to help.' And down he came, leaving the Dulcibella to her own devices. "'I think I'll go on deck,' I said. Why in the world couldn't you lunch comfortably at Ecken and save this infernal pandemonium of a picnic? 
Where's the yacht going to, meanwhile? And how are we to lunch on that slanting table? I'm covered with varnish and mud, and ankle-deep in crockery. There goes the beer. You shouldn't have stood it on the table with this list on, said Davies, with intense composure. But it won't do any harm. It'll drain into the bilge. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, I thought. You go on deck now, and I'll finish getting ready. I regretted my explosion, though wrung from me under great provocation. Keep her straight on as she's going, said Davies, as I clambered up out of the chaos, brushing the dust off my trousers and varnishing the ladder with my hands. I unlashed the helm and kept her as she was going. We had rounded a sharp bend in the fjord and were sailing up a broad and straight reach which every moment disclosed new beauties, sights fair enough to be balm to the angriest spirit. A red-roofed hamlet was on our left, on the right an ivied ruin, close to the water, where some contemplative cattle stood knee-deep. The view ahead was a white strand which fringed both shores, and to it fell wooded slopes, interrupted here and there by low sandstone cliffs of warm red colouring, and now and again by a dingle with cracks of greenswood. I forgot petty squallows and enjoyed things, the coy tremble of the tiller and the backwash of air from the dingy mainsail, and with a somewhat chastened rapture, the lunch which Davies brought up to me and solicitously watched me eat. Later, as the wind sank to lazy airs, he became busy with a larger topsail and jib, but I was content to doze away the afternoon, drenching brain and body in the sweet and novel foreign atmosphere, and dreamily watching the fringe of glen cliff and cool white sand as they passed ever more slowly by. End of chapter 3 Read by Gesine in May 2007《Riddle of the Sands》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. The Riddle of the Sands by Erskine Childers. Chapter 4 Retrospect. Wake up! I rubbed my eyes and wondered where I was, stretched myself painfully, too for even the cushions had not given me a true bed of roses. It was dusk, and the yacht was stationary in glassy water, coloured by the last afterglow. A roofing of thin upper cloud had spread over most of the sky, and a subtle smell of rain was in the air. We seemed to be in the middle of the fjord, whose shores looked distant and steep in the gathering darkness. Close ahead they faded away suddenly, and the sight lost itself in a grey void. The stillness was absolute. "'We can't get to Sonderberg tonight,' said Davies. "'What's to be done, then?' I asked, collecting my senses. "'Oh, we'll anchor anywhere here. We're just at the mouth of the fjord. I'll tow her inshore if you'll steer in that direction.' He pointed vaguely at a blur of trees and cliff. Then he jumped into the dinghy, cast off the painter, and, after snatching at the slack of a rope, began towing the reluctant yacht by short jacks of the skulls. The menacing aspect of that grey void, combined with a natural preference for getting to some definite place at night, combined to depress my spirits afresh. In my sleep I had dreamed of Morven Lodge, of heather tea-parties after glorious slaughters of grouse, of salmon leaping in amber pools, and now... "'Just take a cast of the lead, will you?' came Davis's voice above the splash of the skulls. "'Where is it?' I shouted back. "'Never mind, we're close enough now. Let Can you manage to let go the anchor?' I hurried forward and picked impotently at the bonds of the sleeping monster. But Davies was aboard again and stirred him with a deft touch or two, until he crashed into the water with a grinding of chain. "'We shall do well here,' said he. "'Isn't this rather an open anchorage?' I suggested. 
"'It's only open from that quarter,' he replied. "'If it comes on to blow from there, we shall have to clear out. "'But I think it's only rain. "'Let's stow the sails.' "'Another whirlwind of activity, in which I joined as effectively as I could, "'oppressed by the prospect of having to clear out who knows whither at midnight. "'But Davies's sang-froid was infectious, I suppose, and the little den below, bright lit and soon fragrant with cookery, pleaded insistently for affection. Yachting in this singular style was hungry work, I found. Steak tastes none the worse for having been wrapped in newspaper, and the slight traces of the day's news disappear with frying and onions and potato chips. Davies was indeed on his mettle for this his first dinner to his guest, for he produced with stealthy pride not from the dishonoured grave of the beer, but from some more hallowed recess, a bottle of German champagne, from which we drank success to the Dulcibella. "'I wish you would tell me all about your cruise from England,' I asked. "'You must have had some exciting adventures. Here are the charts. Let's go over them.' "'We must wash up first, he replied, and I was tactfully introduced to one of his very few standing orders— that tobacco should not burn, nor postprandial chat begin, until that distasteful process had ended. It would never get done otherwise, he sagely opined. But when we were finally settled with cigars, a variety of which culled from many ports, German, Dutch and Belgian, Davies kept in a battered old box in the net rack, the promised talk hung fire. I'm no good at description, he complained, and there's really very little to tell. We left Dover, Morrison and I, on 6th of August, made a good passage to Ostend. You had some fun there, I suppose? I put in, thinking of, well, of Ostend, in August. Fun! A filthy hole, I call it. We had to stop a couple of days as we fouled a boy coming in and carried away the bobstay. We lay in a dirty little tidal dock, and there was nothing to do on shore. "'Well, what next?' "'We had a splendid sail to the East Scheldt, "'but then, like fools, decided to go through Holland by canal and river. "'It was good fun enough navigating the estuary. "'The tides and banks there are appalling, "'but farther inland it was a wretched business, "'nothing but paying locked dues, bumping against skites, "'and towing down stinking canals. "'Never a peaceful night like this, "'always moored by some quay or towpath with people passing and boys. Heaven, shall I ever forget those boys? A perfect moraine of them infests Holland. They seem to have nothing in the world to do but throw stones and mud at foreign yachts. They want a Herod, with some statesmanlike views on infanticide. By Jove, yes, but the fact is that you want a crew for that pottering inland work. They can smack the boys and keep an eye on the skulls. A boat like this should stick to the sea, or out-of-the-way places on the coast. Well, after Amsterdam. You've skipped a great deal, haven't you? I interrupted. Oh, have I? Well, let me see. We went by Dordrecht to Rotterdam. Nothing to see there, and swarms of tugs buzzing about and shaving one's bows every second. On by the Fecht River to Amsterdam, and thence, Lord, what a relief it was, out into the North Sea again. The weather had been still and steamy, but it broke up finally now, and we had a rattling three-reef sail to the Zuidersee. He reached up to the bookshelf for what looked like an ancient ledger, and turned over the leaves. "'Is that your log?' I asked. "'I should like to have a look at it.' "'Oh, you'd find it dull reading, if you could read it at all. It's just short notes about winds and bearings and so on.' He was turning some leaves over rapidly. Now, why don't you keep a log of what we do? I can't describe things, and you can. I've half a mind to try, I said. We want another chart now. And he pulled down a second, yet more stained and frayed than the first. We had a splendid time then, exploring the Zuidersee, its northern part at least, and round those islands which bound it to the north. 
Those are the Frisian Islands, and they stretch for a hundred and twenty miles or so eastward. You see, the first two of them, Texel and Fleeland, shut in the Zuidersee, and the rest border the Dutch and German coasts. What's all this? I said, running my finger over some dotted patches which covered much of the chart. The latter was becoming unintelligible. Clean-cut coasts and neat regiments of little figures had given place to a confusion of winding and intersecting lines and bald spaces. All sand, said Davies, enthusiastically. You can't think what a splendid sailing ground it is. You can explore for days without seeing a soul. These are the channels, you see. They are very badly charted. This chart was almost useless, but it made it all the more fun. No towns or harbours, just a village or two on the islands, if you wanted stores. They look rather desolate, I said. Desolate's no word for it. They're really only gigantic sandbanks themselves. Wasn't all this rather dangerous? I asked. Not a bit. You see, that's where our shallow draught and flat bottom came in. We could go anywhere, and it didn't matter running aground. She's perfect for that sort of work. "'And she doesn't really look bad either, does she?' he asked rather wistfully. "'I suppose I hesitated, for he said abruptly, "'Anyway, I don't go in for looks.' "'He had leaned back, and I detected traces of incipient absent-mindedness. "'His cigar, which he had lately been lighting and relighting feverishly, "'a habit of his when excited, seemed now to have expired for good. "'About running aground,' I persisted. "'Surely that's apt to be dangerous.' "'He sat up and felt round for a match. "'Not the least if you know where you can run risks and where you can't. "'Anyway, you can't possibly help it. "'That chart may look simple to you.' "'Simple,' I thought. "'But at half flood all those banks are covered. "'The islands and coasts are scarcely visible. "'They are so low and everything looks the same. "'This graphic description of a splendid cruising ground, took away my breath. Of course there is risk sometimes. Choosing an anchorage requires care. You can generally get a nice berth under the lee of a bank, but the tides run strong in the channels, and if there's a gale blowing... Didn't you ever take a pilot? I interrupted. Pilot? Why, the whole point of the thing... He stopped short. I did take one once later on, he resumed, with an odd smile which faded at once. "'Well?' I urged, for I saw a reverie was coming. "'Oh, here I'm me ashore, of course. Serve me right. I wonder what the weather's doing.' He rose, glanced at the aneroid, the clock, and the half-closed skylight with a curious circular movement, and went a step or two up the companion ladder, where he remained for several minutes with head and shoulders in the open air. There was no sound of wind outside, but the Dulcibella had begun to move in her sleep, as it were, rolling drowsily to some taint send of the sea, with an occasional short jump, like the start of an uneasy dreamer. "'What does it look like?' I called from my sofa. I had to repeat the question. "'Rain coming,' said Davies, returning, "'and possibly wind, but we're safe enough here.' It's coming from the south-west. Shall we turn in? We haven't finished your cruise yet, I said. Light a pipe and tell me the rest. All right, he agreed, with more readiness than I expected. After Terschelling, here it is, the third island from the west, I potted along eastward. I? Oh, I forgot. Morrison had to leave me there. I missed him badly, but I hoped at that time to get Blank to join me. I could manage all right single-handed, but for that sort of work two are much better than one. The plate's beastly heavy. In fact, I had to give up using it for fear of a smash. After Terschelling, I jogged his memory. Well, I followed the Dutch islands. Ameland, Schiermonnikog, Rotem. Outlandish names, aren't they? "'sometimes outside them, sometimes inside. "'It was a bit lonely, but grand sport and very interesting. 
The charts were shocking, but I worried out most of the channels. I suppose those waters are only used by small local craft? I put in. That would account for inaccuracies. Did Davies think that admiralties had time to waste on smoothing the road for such chaotic little craft as his, in all its inquisitive ramblings? But he fired up. That's all very well, he said. But think what folly it is. However, that's a long story and will bore you. To cut matters short, for we ought to be turning in, I got to Borkum, that's the first of the German islands. He pointed at a round, bare lozenge lying in the midst of a welter of sandbanks. Rotom, this queer little one, it has only one house on it, is the most easterly Dutch island, and the mainland of Holland ends here, opposite it, at the Ems River indicating a dismal cavity on the coast, sown with names suggestive of mud and wrecks and dreariness. "'What state was this?' I asked. "'About the ninth of this month.' "'Why, that's only a fortnight before you wired to me. "'You were pretty quick getting to Flensburg. "'Wait a bit, we want another chart. "'Is this the next?' "'Yes, but we scarcely need it.' I only went a little way farther on, to Norderney, in fact, the third German island. Then I decided to go straight for the Baltic. I had always had an idea of getting there, as Knight did in the Falcon. So I made a passage of it to the Eider River, there on the West Schleswig coast, took the river and canal through to Kiel on the Baltic, and from there made another passage up north to Flensburg. I was a week there, and then you came, and here we are. And now let's turn in. We'll have a fine sail tomorrow. He ended with rather forced vivacity and briskly rolled up the chart. The reluctance he had shown from the first to talk about his cruise had been for a brief space forgotten in his enthusiasm about a portion of it, but had returned markedly in this bald conclusion. I felt sure that there was more in it than more disinclination to spin nautical yarns in the hardy Corinthian style, which can be so offensive in amateur yachtsmen, and I thought I guessed the explanation. His voyage single-handed to the Baltic from the Frisian Islands had been a foolhardy enterprise with perilous incidents, which, rather than make light of, he would not refer to at all. Probably he was ashamed of his recklessness, and wished to ignore it with me, an inexperienced acquaintance, not yet enamoured of the Dulcibella's way of life, whom both courtesy and interest demanded that he should inspire with confidence. I liked him all the better as I came to this conclusion, but I was tempted to persist a little. I slept the whole afternoon, I said, and to tell the truth, I rather dread the idea of going to bed. It's so tiring. Look here, you've rushed over that last part like an express train. That passage to the Schleswig coast. The Eider River, did you say? It was a longish one, wasn't it? Well, you see what it was. About seventy miles, I suppose, direct. He spoke low, bending down to sweep up some cigar ashes on the floor. Direct? I insinuated. Then you put in somewhere? I stopped once, anchored for the night. Oh, that's nothing of a sail with a fair wind. By Jove! I've forgotten to cork that seam over your bunk, and it's going to rain. I must do it now. Ye turn in. He disappeared. My curiosity, never very consuming, was banished by concern as to the open seam, for the prospect of a big drop, remorseless and regular as fate, falling on my forehead throughout the night, as in the torture-chamber of the Inquisition, was alarming enough to recall me wholly to the immediate future. So I went to bed, finding on the whole that I had made progress in the exercise, though still far from being the trained contortionist that the occasion called for. Hammering ceased, and Davies reappeared just as I was stretched on the rack, and tucked up in my bunk, I mean. "'I say,' he said, when he was settled in his, and darkness reigned. Do you think you'll like this sort of thing? 
"'If there are many places about here as beautiful as this,' I replied, "'I think I shall. "'But I should like to land now and then and have a walk. "'Of course a great deal depends on the weather, doesn't it? "'I hope this rain—' "'Drops had begun to patter overhead. "'Doesn't mean that the summer's over for good.' "'Oh, you can sail just the same,' said Davies. "'Unless it's very bad. "'There's plenty of sheltered water. "'There's bound to be a change soon.' "'But then there are the ducks. "'The colder and stormier it is, the better for them.' "'I had forgotten the ducks and the cold, "'and suddenly presented as a shooting-box in inclement weather. "'The Dulcibella lost ground in my estimation, "'which she had latterly gained. "'I'm fond of shooting,' I said, "'but I'm afraid I'm only a fair-weather yachtsman, "'and I should much prefer sun and scenery.' "'Scenery!' he repeated, reflectively. I say, you must have thought it a queer taste of mine to cruise about on that outlandish Frisian coast. How would you like that sort of thing? I should loathe it, I answered promptly, with a clear conscience. Weren't you delighted yourself to get to the Baltic? It must be a wonderful contrast to what you described. Did you ever see another yacht there? Only one, he answered. Good night. Good night. End of chapter four. Recorded by Gazina in May two thousand and seven.